Welcome everyone. My name is Adam Lerner. I am the founder of Solvable and here with my teammate uh, May Bartlett and May is going to be hosting this dialogue and I'm here just to introduce the series. Uh, we're honored to have you all here. This is a conversation that we've been looking forward to. From the moment we began planning this series around regeneration, we knew that cult, we wanted to place culture at the center of this conversation. And specifically, we had this idea of the kind of magic of bringing two individuals together who we deeply respect, and that's Andre Snare Magnuson and Melanie Goodchild, uh, both incredible storytellers in understanding the systems uh, that surround us and the power of those systems in order to be able to create a, a regenerative future. We will, in a kind of meta way, be using this as a conversation space to regenerate culture in the process of conversation by telling stories. And, uh, and it's, it's really going to be an incredible unfolding together. We are co-hosting this with, with the Turtle Island Institute, which Melanie uh, Goodchild is the, is the executive director, and with her colleague, um, Carrie Ann Agawa, and it, we're honored to be able to co-host that with them. And, um, and we would like, I would like to start by introducing Melanie. Uh, so Melanie, uh, I found that I got connected to Melanie through somebody that is a, basically a family member of mine, who's a colleague and teammate at Solvable, Charles Holmes, who has known Melanie and worked with Melanie for a number of years. And uh, it's been an honor to get to know her and to bring her work into this space. And Melanie, I invite you to uh, share your own introduction, please. Miigwech Adam. Bonjour and dinner, Magan and Duk. So I said, greetings to you, my relatives. Thank you for listening. I'm Moose Clan and I'm Anishinaabe. Those are my two spirit names, what I've known in the spirit world in Ojibwe. And in English, I'm known as Mulaney, named after my dad, Delaney, and my mom, Melinda. And they halved it up, <clears throat> spelled it like Melanie, but it is pronounced Mulaney. And I'm here in uh, the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Three Fires Confederacy, which is near Niagara Falls, Ontario, Canada, in our home here in Crystal Beach. Our home for a short time. We are in the process of moving home to where I'm, I'm from. Uh, I'm actually from Kitagonzibi, Nindonjaba, and uh, so those are the two First Nations I'm from, about eight hours northwest of here. And we're in the process of moving home to Bawating, which is the place of the rapids, to St. Marie, Ontario. And I'm the founder of, of Turtle Island Institute, moving on soon from that role to finish my dissertation and, and pursue some other things. But Turtle Island Institute will continue uh, its work in the world. And I am really honored to, to be here and introduce... Uh, the author of the book on time and water, um, Andre, who's a master storyteller, an environmentalist, uh, environmental activist. And this is what my copy of the book looks like at the moment. Um, I really enjoyed the book and I'll turn it over to Andre for his introductions. Miigwech. Hello, I'm uh, honored to be in your company. It's a nice group here. I'm uh, actually now in Toronto, which I don't actually, know the ancestor, ancestral lands uh, who actually was here before, but, uh, but uh, I have been, uh, I'm here for a screening of my film here in a, in a festival and, uh, and also to uh, follow up with my book. So I'm a children's book writer, a uh, documentary filmmaker, sometimes a poet. Uh, this is my children's book. Uh, a casket of time and uh, or a young adult book and this also here is uh, the story of the blue planet also my children's book so i've been kind of uh, in my career i've kind of been gen uh, genres genre surfing you could say uh, that is uh, and and often uh, betraying my audience that is uh, i started with a book of poetry many years ago and when people wanted more poetry I did a children's book 
and when they wanted another children's book, I did sci-fi that kids can't understand, a book called Love Star. And when people wanted more Love Star, I did a non-fiction book that is called Dreamland about dams uh, and aluminum in the highlands of Iceland. So, uh, so I've been kind of going between uh, forms and uh, now I'm going to read for you a short chapter from uh, a short passage from my book on time and water and it kind of grasps uh, and, and th that book is, uh, is uh, you could say it's about climate change but when I told my friends I was writing about climate change I could see how their eyes glazed because they thought it was so boring and I, I was wondering like how, how can the biggest the biggest uh, issue in the world be considered boring and um, and I reframed it and I said, I'm writing about time and water. And then everybody was well, like, wow, interesting. And uh, so I was thinking there's something uh, maybe about storytelling that's been wrong about how the issue is brought to us. So uh, here's a short chapter. The phone rings and Grandma Hulda runs to answer it. We sit down to eat pancakes as the radio hums low in the background. I ask Hulda Filipia, my daughter, to do a little maths puzzle. How old is your great grandma if she is born in 1924? She's 94, Hulda replies immediately. Fast math, I say. Well, I knew how old she is, Hulda grins. All right, but now you really have to calculate. When will you be 94? So it would be the year I was born 2008 plus 94, she asks. Exactly. She takes a piece of paper and pen and looks skeptically at the sheet. She shows me the result as though it must be a misunderstanding. Is that right? 2,102? Yes. And hopefully you'll be just as energetic as Grandma Hulda is now. Maybe you'll even be living in this same house Maybe your 10-year-old great-granddaughter will be visiting, sitting with you in this kitchen in 2102, just like you are sitting here right now. Yes, maybe, says Hulda, sipping a glass of milk. One more equation. When will your great-granddaughter be 94 years old? Hulda writes some figures on a piece of paper with a little help. Would she have been born in 2092? Yes, maybe, I say. Okay, 2092 plus 94 is 2186. She laughs at the thought. Can you imagine that? You born in 2008 might know a girl that will still be alive in the year 2186. Will the purses her mouth and looks into the air. Can I go now, she asks. Almost, I say. One more math puzzle. How long is it from 1924 to 2,186? Hulda does the math. Is it 262 years? Imagine that, 262 years. That's the length of time you connect across. You know the people who span this time. Your time is the time of the people you know and love, the time that molds you. And your time is the people, time of the people you will know and love the time that you will shape. You can touch 262 years with your bare hands. Your grandma taught you. You will teach your great granddaughter. You can have a direct impact on the future right up to the year 2186. Imagine that. Thanks, Andre. I love that passage. I'm going to guide us through a little visualization with the intention of helping each of you connect with your ancestral lineage. Um, before we begin, I just want to acknowledge that many of our ancestral histories have varying degrees of trauma associated with them. So full permission to self-regulate as we go through this process. If anything comes up that you can't be with right now, then open your eyes, move yourself, do whatever you need to uh, take care of yourself throughout this process, but hopefully it will be a positive experience to help you touch the edges of time as well. 
So go ahead and close your eyes if that's comfortable for you, or you can just keep a soft gaze at the floor in front of your feet. And start by bringing your awareness to your breath. Notice how your breath feels inside of your lungs. Can you feel the rise and fall of your chest with each inhale and exhale? Can you feel the oxygen move all the way down into your low belly? And allow your breath to move through your body, creating spaciousness and relaxation, releasing any stress or tension you might be carrying in this moment. And I want you to think of the oldest relative that you've known. Maybe it's a grandparent or a great grandparent. Maybe they're still alive or not. And I want you to let yourself travel back to the year that they were born. If you don't know the specific year, that's all right. Just think of what the decade might have been. And as you travel backwards into the past, just start by noticing where you are. When this relative of yours was born, what was their family like? What living situation do you imagine them in? Where were they in the world? What was their community like? How did people organize themselves and interact with one another? What was the political atmosphere of this time in this place? What ideals and beliefs are present? What shaped the way this ancestor of yours came into the world? And then slowly let yourself move forwards in time, thinking about the different events that shaped them along the way and how the world shifted and changed along with them. until you find yourself back in the present moment, sitting in your chair, breathing each breath. And now think of the youngest relative that you might know in your lifetime. Maybe it's a grandchild or great grandchild or a grand niece or nephew or a great grand niece or nephew. And let yourself travel forward into the future all the way to the end of their life. Imagine what year it might be.
And as you show up in this future, notice what their life is like. How do they interact with their family? What are the things that they care about? And what does their community look like and feel like? And what's the political atmosphere of their time? What ideals and beliefs do they have? And how do they interact with each other and the world around them? Take a few more moments to soak in this future. This future that you had a direct impact on. And that you influenced in bigger ways than you probably thought imaginable. imaginable. And slowly let yourself travel backwards in time. Noticing any events that stand out for you along the way. Moving backwards through your lineage until you reach yourself right now in this time and space. Feel your feet on the floor, your back against your chair, and once again reconnect with your breath. And just take a moment to acknowledge how you feel having just touched the edges of time. And as you're ready, you can open your eyes and re-enter the group. Mm. Now we're going to start our conversation with Andre and Malini, which I've been very much looking forward to. And I wanna open it with a question for each of you. I would love it if each of you shared a myth or story that you think captures the essence of a regenerative culture. Either one of you can go first, whichever one of you has a story pop into your mind sooner. Melanie. Okay, sure. So when I when I think about a regenerative culture, you most folks know when we we hear about uh, the the oral traditions that get passed on. And they get passed on in different ways through song, through ceremonies, they're encoded in our language. And so we you know, we we do have a history as well of of writing things down, but not in the in the sense that we think of it English and texts. We have sacred birch bark scrolls and pictographs, and those pictographs are are put there by humans, but they're also put there so they're uh, like you know stone canvas drawings on on rocks. Uh, and back where I'm moving, there's there's sacred pictographs there. And I was talking to an elder about uh, some of the the petroglyphs or the the pictographs as well in Lake of the Woods. My grandmother's from Treaty Three up near uh, Fort Francis in Kenora, Ontario. And I remember reading about and hearing about a legend of of how difficult it was to go to some of those places to see to like you know with your own eyes to go visit those those sacred uh, paintings or or pictographs. And this is an example of, you know, when you when we talk about having a colonized mind, I, I thought, oh, there's there's these sacred colors that they get and how they prepare and, and put these images on the rock that stay there for thousands of years. And I just always assumed that it was human beings that put some of those images there. And uh, I was talking to my sister, Eleanor Skeed from, from Lake of the Woods, Washishkinagum, and she said, well, some of those were put there by spirit too. 
And I think the, the disenchantment of the world has kind of interrupted those regenerative stories. You know, our culture is, is part of it is, is sitting around the campfire, the Ishkode or the sacred fire and, and listening to stories. Uh, but we don't do that as much anymore. And I remember uh, Jerry Mander wrote a book called In the Absence of the Sacred, and he interviewed some of our First Nation communities up north that got satellite television uh, back in the 80s and 90s and talking to the elders. And they were they were lamenting the loss of time because the TV is, you know, just being broadcast at you and someone else is controlling this, the story and the images. So um, and so I will share a very short story here about uh how my culture for me has been regenerative through experiencing stories you know those we have two types of stories uh the bajama win are like our personal stories and Anzukan are the sacred legends and so i'm not going to share a sacred legend i'm going to share a personal story uh, and I've, I've shared this uh, before but when i was uh grieving the loss of my mom's sister she passed away from cancer i invited a friend of mine uh, he was a singer because uh, songs and singing are good medicine for us, Mushkiki. I invited him to come in and sing a song at her memorial. And so he stood there beside me and I was holding a migaze, miguan, an eagle feather. And you know, you're deep in grief. So you're, you're full of emotions. And of course, those songs, I also think of the bagpipes, you know, when they play the bagpipes at a funeral and uh, in those settings that makes you cry even harder. And so he was singing this beautiful song, but it wasn't an Ishnabe. I, I, I recognized some of the language and it was Lakota. And he had spent time with a singer, his name was Brian Lyons. Uh, and this was in Thunder Bay where I was uh, lived before. He sang this beautiful song and he said to me afterwards, and as he sang and he was hitting his hand drum, his tears were flowing. I mean, he was singing so hard and he didn't really, you know, he wasn't in deep grief like my family was, but uh, he recognized that we were grieving, of course. And he had a heart condition. So I was a little bit worried about how hard he was singing. Anyway, afterwards, he told me that that was a Lakota morning song, not morning like sun, sunlight coming up, but, but grief morning. And he had spent time down in Pine Ridge, uh, South Dakota, and he sang with the original Pine Ridge singers. And so a few months later, he was in the hospital and I was visiting with his, his dad. And his dad said, uh, I hope my son is okay. I hope he doesn't go back to the spirit world before me. And his dad was fighting cancer. So there was sort of like, you know, parents don't want to outlive their children. But sadly, Brian passed. And, and he was in his late 40s. And this was, a, I don't know, maybe 10 or 12 years ago. And so I went up, to, I traveled up to uh, Rainy River First Nations, Manitou, for Brian's uh, memorial service. And, and we have our sacred fires. And we were there in the community center for four days. And on the fourth day at midnight, but just before the fourth day, some folks arrived and they brought horses. They brought horses with them. And one horse in particular they brought. And then just before midnight, this old man comes into the, in through the back door of the community center. He has a cowboy hat and he's got someone helping him. And he was one of the last remaining singers of the Pine Ridge Singers. And he took out his drum and he sang that song. The only times in my life, two times I've heard that Lakota morning song. And he was singing it for Brian. And I was sitting there with Brian's dad and the family, all the family members, and it was, it was so moving. But it was such good medicine and yet it, you know, it, it made you cry uh, really hard. And the next morning, they had four horses. And this was part of the bringing together of Lakota and Anishinaabe because Brian had spent time with the Lakota, our relatives. And there were four horses and they were, they were fully dressed. And there were three riders, but the fourth horse didn't have a rider. And that was for Brian's spirit to ride into the spirit world. And so when I, when I recount that story, I'm regenerating our culture, you know, like, because everything was colonized, how we bury people, how we bring babies into the world, like from, from life to, to death, colonization, settler colonization here on Turtle Island, which is different than in, in Iceland, has really affected and impacted our lives. And so, so the regeneration is, you know, being able to tell that story in Anishinaabe would be um, a goal of mine someday, because I don't speak our language fluently. 
But just every time I tell that story, it makes me feel really good because that's unconditional love. Uh, those people drove 17 hours from South Dakota. They rendered that song and they left just to honor, you know, his memory. Um, and I, I, that's the story that comes to mind when I think about, you know, uh, a Dabajima win. One of the stories that I carry with me of, of something I experienced that was really profound and unconditional love. And so it, it makes me feel good when I, it's good medicine to share that story. So thank you for listening. Mm, that is good medicine. Thank you, Malini. Um, I love, I love the piece about the medicine bringing you to tears. I feel like most medicine is, is working if it's bringing you to tears. Um, and just the, the commitment and, and honoring of people driving so far and um, coming together for that. And it feels so contrary to our culture. It makes me think of, you know, here in the States, there's a two week bereavement period um, when you lose someone. And after that two weeks, it is considered clinical depression if you're still in a state of mourning and grief. And I just think that's absurd. We need more room for grief and being able to, to honor that stage of life too. So thank you for sharing that story. Yeah. Andre. Yeah. Thank you for sharing this story. I, I think I was, you know, I was rattling my brain and I was um, kind of remembering that I think the reason why I wrote my book was because of lack of these stories. That is a uh, lack of mythology and lack of cultural long-term thinking, kind of uh, thinking beyond the four years of, you know, basically all the noise around us is about the four-year terms of the next president or, or government and uh, the quarterly annual impact assessment of companies. Uh, so I, I felt like it was uh, difficult for us culturally to imagine the future and imagine our presence. And I actually think it's deeper that uh, culturally uh, we are embedded with the year 2000 as like almost a roof over our, uh, like I was raised with the year 2000 in school as, as a very distant future. And, uh, and I think in a very strange way that everybody that met, for example, in Glasgow, I, I think that without knowing that we think that 2050 is 50 years from now. And I think uh, that we feel like 1970 was 30 years ago. And uh, and uh, and I have asked and 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 maybe and at, at least if I go to two thousand one hundred, I feel like that is after one hundred years, not not eight years. So so I think everybody that was at Glasgow discussing the future, that they were all feeling like they were discussing something fifty years into the future, but not thirty years or just just around the corner. And I think we're going through a cultural shift now because it's maybe a coincidence or uh, or something that uh, that the climate crisis which is all about time and and our, our impact on the planet is is happening now and the urgency is happening now while the generation that has the responsibility doesn't feel the urgency because we're disconnected from time culturally and then the generation that is now in the climate strikes, 15 to 18, they have nothing to do about this uh, embedded 2000 as a roof over their future. They're paying into pension funds to get their first uh, money in the year 2070. So, so they are already in a, in a, in a, some kind of a financial or a physical connection to that future. So, so what, what inspired me to try to stretch my thinking about uh, not only the old age of my children, but actually uh, beyond that, was when I was listening to uh, recordings of old songs, I, I stumbled into an archives where folklorists were uh, collecting old hymns, old lullabies, old uh, folklore uh, around Iceland, because Iceland was very isolated, 
even its village or, or it, we didn't even have villages. Each farm was very isolated. Each farm was almost like a self-contained culture. And then each, uh, each kind of region was very, very uh, isolated as well because of mountains and roaring rivers that were impossible. So I would be listening to the recording of an old woman, a recording maybe from 1960, of an old, old woman that was born 1880, that was remembering something that she learned from her grandmother that was born 1820, that she knew that she had learned from her grandmother that was born in uh, 1780 or something like that. So, so I, I really felt that a, a single old woman could carry, you know, 200 years or 300 years of memory uh, within a single song. So instead of, instead of uh, the message of the song itself telling you something, because sometimes these would just be stupid songs or, or horrible lullabies or, or just, you know, just uh, random things that they would be remembering and carrying on. But it reminded you of a culture where the oldest was teaching the youngest. Mm -hmm. That is where the 80 year old had the role of teaching the five year old. And then that five year old carrying those memories into his or her 80s, again, teaching this, this long cycle of memory. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was uh, astonished of kind of experiencing that the whole summer when I was 23 or something and having my first child at the same time, and I was listening to the culture that I was living in, where everybody was segmented into target groups, where there was almost like a firewall between generations, of, where the market almost created firewalls between generations, and, and uh, a 20-year-old almost had no interaction with the culture of a 30-year-old that had almost no interaction. And, and the youth culture, so basically it was like 22-year-old guys in the radio teaching the 15-year-olds. And you were just feeling this spinning of, uh, of, uh, of memory. And, and, uh, and with that, we were lo losing values and language and words. Uh, and I was just thinking, okay, maybe there's something called progress in terms of values, because the old generation maybe had all sorts of prejudice and things that we wanted to get rid of. But at the same time, other things were getting lost and not remembered. And I was, uh, so that was kind of my big inspiration for thinking about like, uh, when will somebody remember uh, how far into the future could I carry a memory from my grandmother? And when would that memory be remembered through myself by my grandchild, for example? So this uh, handshake of generations, these. 250 years of intimate time that we can touch with our bare hands. And I thought that could be uh, useful maybe as a some kind of an antidote against this short termness. Yeah, um, so many things are rattling around in my head. I think just the significance that our perspective of time plays in our culture and, and how we you know, how that shapes our actions is so significant. So thank you for bringing that into this discussion. And, um, you know, we also live in a culture here in the West where the youth and the elderly are separated and so much is missing there. And that time perspective seems like a big piece that's missing there. Um, I, I'd love to know from both of your perspectives, what are the other components of culture that you see influencing the climate? I mean, time perception is a big one. What else do you see? I think there's there's so many different aspects um, that that come with time. Actually, um, time and space uh, one, and you know, I study complexity from a Western perspective, systems thinking and complexity, but from an Anishinaabe and Gikandasawin or Indamawin, which is our original ways of knowing and our wisdom, knowledge resides on the land and is revealed to you through personal experiences on the land. And so I think the land herself and, and the concept of that land being a sentient being and, and full of animacy, uh, even in our opening exercise, when you th said, think of a relative, 
um, this morning or this afternoon. I was I was thinking uh, quite expansively of relatives, and I started to think about the old and fair relatives I know, Mother Earth and and the stars and the moon and the sun, and and then I started to think about uh, relatives as human beings and started to think about you know family members and. So, so the, the, the language I think that we use to describe things, even the structure of that language, you know, a lot of indigenous languages and, and other than English languages have words that we don't have in English. And so, so much of the, the dialogue around these big issues is, is you know, based in, in the English language, even internationally. And so sometimes other words, a Japanese word or, you know, a Haudenosaunee, a Mohawk word I know has, has been brought into international documents. But I think there's a there's a, a concept uh, within system called mental models, and and I kind of think about mental models as how you are predisposed through language to think about your relationship with the world, to think about relationality, and that relationality will quite easily move towards a separation from nature or nature as a commodity, nature as a resource. If you're not thinking about that nature trees, mountains, waters, glaciers, as sentient beings, if you're thinking about them as an it, as a noun. I mean, when you hear the word glacier in English, for example, you know, what are you thinking of? What image? And we use the iceberg model actually quite frequently in systems thinking to talk about, you know, deep down fundamental um, problems versus uh, the symptomatic kind of event level way of doing things. And so from, from sitting with you know, elders sitting on the land in, in ceremony when I was young, I remember <clears throat> reading a, a, a little book, it was a tiny little book by Chief Dan George. And he was, uh, he's a, uh, he was an elder, he was an actor actually, he was well known for, for being in movies. Um, but he wrote this book, My Heart Soars and another one called My Spirit Soars. And, and I was about 13, you know, and really wanting to, to be in a deeper relationship with my own culture and heritage. And I went to my first Mama Dasu in my first sweat lodge. But it was a passage in that book. My mom gave me these two little books. And, and he wrote them as kind of prose and poems. And there was one called The Wolf Ceremony. And he talked about taking his grandchild into the woods to sing the wolf song. And the grandchild sat there and listened. And he sang the wolf song. And he was waiting for the wolves to answer. And they didn't answer. And the grandchild kind of said, okay, grandpa, can I go back home now and play or watch TV? And, and he thought, what is gonna happen when we reach a time when people don't do the wolf song or the wolf ceremony or the wolves don't answer? And I thought about that even as you know, a teenager is kind of a metaphorical, um, but also as quite literal that we need to, to be have regenerative cultures and to and these cultures influencing how we relate to our relatives in the natural world that that they need to hear from us and there's there's really a lament amongst i think a lot of elders across many cultures that i've uh had the opportunity to sit with and and yarn uh you know like an aboriginal uh australia tradition of yarning the the idea of if we don't sing those songs, they don't hear them anymore, we forget about them. Mm. And then they're not gonna answer us. Maybe they're not there, but they're also gonna feel like we don't, we're not in relationship with them anymore. And so, so a lot of our ceremonies and cultural teachings are about maintaining those relationships with our, with our kin. So I think that's, that's huge. Uh, a huge aspect of it is, is time and space and uh, language, yeah, language. I think uh, language is a fundamental part. Of course, uh, so I speak Icelandic. That's my my native language, and uh, and I write in Icelandic. We're we're three hundred thousand, three hundred hundred and fifty thousand speakers of that language. So uh, so uh, you can see very clearly, and that's what I was uh, trying to do in my book. Is uh, and uh, and it just does not only uh, do with Icelandic, but uh, I, there was a climate scientist that asked me why why don't you write about climate change? And when I and he and I said I don't feel I have authority. I, I feel like that's something that a scientist should be doing. 
but he said that uh, that uh, people don't understand data, they understand stories, and, and that's what they relate to. But again, I think also that my question that I felt that this was an issue for scientists was also some kind of a segregation of, mm -hmm. of uh, maybe symbolic for the issue that that of course this is our issue. This is this is all. This is it's about everything that we are, and we can't just outsource that discussion to scientists. Even though you you should respect the science, and uh, and the science has something to uh, to tell us. But there are many other aspects to the issue than than only through the observations of science. But when I started to try to translate the science to language. I understood that actually we're confronted with issues that are larger than language. Mm. That is, if I if I tell you here that in the next uh, before 2100, we expect the pH level of the world oceans to drop from 8.1 to 7.7, .7, and that is the greatest change in the world oceans for uh, 50 million years. I just said it. I, I used language. I said it in words. But uh, but the scale of everything that I said is in a strange way larger than language. Mm. That is, for the first part, that, like I said before, we're not con culturally connected to 2100. Th that's all uh, for Marvel Comics and Blade Runner. Uh, Blade Runner was actually 2019. That was the first furthest people could think uh, mm. when they were making that film. That, that was like the furthest beyond 2000 they could allow themselves to put in a film. So 2100 is meaningless. The pH scale as 8.1 to 7.7 .7 is also meaningless. Uh, but for uh, any, anyone that knows uh, the, the logarithmic scale of, of pH, uh, this is a tremendous change. This is a fundamental change of the world oceans. And then, and then 50 million years, I could just as well say 50 gazillion years. Uh, that's again m meaningless because it's so large. It's uh, it's basically, it's basically. But but so you have to just when you write that you have to you have to just stop and say, hey guys, I just wrote it. But you don't understand what I just read because if you really understood what I just said, it would completely, uh, it it would completely transform you. Uh, because you would stop in your in your uh, where you are at and you would totally fundamentally radically rethink everything <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, of, of what you choose what you vote how you consume how you interact with your daily life it would it would be a transformative text but still we hear these words and so what i'm kind of fighting with in my book is is it's like Sometimes we don't understand things until everybody understands them. And even the scientist that tells me these words, he doesn't really understand it until I have understood it. Because we mirror ourselves in a, in a strange way. So, so, so how do you scale up language? I can't say what I said is, is huge, because I just said that, uh, that uh, this boat outside is huge and, uh, and this... Uh, car is huge or uh, or this tree is huge but but how do you talk about the fundaments of everything so that's where i actually have to refer to mythology mm -hmm. because uh, in mythology for example uh, the the world is created in seven days uh, and seven days of creation is closer to 100 years than 100 years are to 50 million years so in mythology the fundaments are changing. In, in history, we are having uh, historical events like uh, kings and empires and, and belief systems. But in mythology, it's like when uh, when when uh, earths are created or uh, or worlds end and uh, and the sun is pulled over the sky with a chariot or something. And and it and in a strange way, it's like we are living closer to mythology. Because, because what is that other than mythology when the world leaders uh, meet in Glasgow discussing sea level? That is nothing that uh, human leaders discussed before. 
uh, you know, Moses, he split the Red Sea. And that was, that's remembered uh, like 6,000 years after whenever that happened. And, but, uh, but, uh, but, but discussing if the oceans, uh, how they are merging glaciers with oceans, that's nothing that Genghis Khan was discussing with his pals and nothing that Caesar in his megalomanic uh, leadership thought he could, he never thought he could raise the world oceans. So, so just to understand that we're in a fundamental different position against reality as, as a species, as humans, having responsibility for something like that. So that is the challenge of the book. And, and I found out in Iceland when I, we were trying to fight for nature, we were trying to fight for a valley, and I felt I was in a regime. I was not allowed to say, no, I think we should protect it because it's beautiful. And I, I was not allowed to say, we should protect this because uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's important for the animals that are, that are there. And, uh, and so, so I could only say, oh, we should protect it because it's beautiful and that would be good for the brand of Iceland. Yeah. Or I could say, let's protect it because it's uh, it might be a good tourist destination, and uh, and it could be important for the local economy if lots of tourists would come there instead of flooding the valley for a for a dam. So so I was not, and then I was astonished. I was reading a travel log of a person that was traveling that area in 1940, and he exploded in poetic language about how his soul resonated with the space dimension of God or something when he was there. So he could he could freely talk about holiness in the year 1940, uh, but I, I could never have, have said, I'm sorry guys, you can't flood the valley because it's sacred. I would just have been a ding dong in the discussion. I, I would never have been invited to the table. And so I was feeling this strangeness that uh, how we have not been allowed to say a forest, a river, a mountain is sacred, which people have been allowed to say for, mm. you know, since the beginning in almost all cultures, that, uh, yeah, not 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 preaching that, not preaching holiness, but asking this question: Did we lose something when we uh, decided to become so rational that we could not say that anymore? Mm. Sorry for the long run. <laughs> no, it's, it's all important. And it makes me think of uh, the prophecies that you shared, Melanie, in our prep call for this. And I feel like those are helpful stories or mythology in order to help people really embody this knowledge and digest it kind of beyond the ability of language like Andrea is, is talking about. So would you mind sharing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. No, I'm I'm happy to. I think um, <clears throat> I think it was put in the in the chat a link. I I wrote an article earlier this year that was published in uh, the Journal of Awareness Based Systems Change, and it was called Relational Systems Thinking. That's how change is going to come from our Earth Mother, and and I co-wrote that with four Mohawk Haudenosaunee uh, knowledge keepers: Dan Longboat, Diane Longboat, Rick. Hill and Kevin Deere, along with uh, Peter Senge and Otto Sharmer at MIT, who are systems scholars, um, all, all, all colleagues of mine. But in that article, we, we talked about um, a teaching from a prophecy, and prophecies involve treaties as well. And this was about the Tura Wampum Belt. And so the original treaty between the Haudenosaunee people and the Dutch at first, and then eventually the French and the English in this area where I live, was something called the Tura Wampum Belt, the Gaswentha. And the Tura Wampum Belt is, is a sacred wampum belt and it's made of these shells from the ocean. And there's white shells, there's three rows of them. And in the middle are two purple columns. And those two purple columns represent those two distinct cultures, the, the Dutch and the Haudenosaunee. So it was a treaty of peace, friendship and respect, but it was also about recognizing that those cultures are equal yet uh, differentiated. And in the, in the article, I talk about uh, the sacred space between. Uh, Willie Ermine, a Cree scholar, calls it ethical space. So when these different uh, sort of binaries or dichotomies come together, different ways of knowing, different ways of being, uh, sometimes they clash. Sometimes there's power dynamics in, in settler colonialism. There's certainly the suppression of, 
of different ways of knowing. And so it's really kind of an invitation. Uh, I wrote some of the article in the Churo Visual Code. So there's, it's not typical text, it's in two different columns. And that's an invitation to, to practice and experience this relational systems thinking. And the reason that, that we offered that, and, uh, and, and Dan Longboat, he talks about cultural fluency. And he says that the sacred space between you, you have to be able to practice cultural fluency. So that's like an open-mindedness to different ways of knowing and being in the world. And Arkin Lashwala, who's an elder from Peru, he talks about uh, in his language, they don't actually have the opposites that we think about in English. Like we, we often think about right, wrong, good, bad, black, white, you know, those types of things as opposites. Instead, he says his language, uh, doesn't really force people to choose sides, but instead to dance with two opposite ideas until the presence of a third shows up. And I love that. Um, I love that that wording, that phrasing of, of being able to have, I guess, a complexity mindset. And I think our ancestors had a complexity mindset. I think they had all kinds of different ways of knowing, uh, coming at them, different types of knowledge, not just what we sort of respect now in terms of you know education, formal education. And so, uh, the time that we're in is a time of prophecy. And so, you know, in, in climate um, science, we certainly hear about the geological um, epoch that we're in, the Anthropocene or Anthropocene. In our culture, the Anishinaabe, uh, there's prophecy. And in the prophecy of the seventh fire, which we are in now, my teachings from uh, Mama Dasawin a couple of years ago are that we are, we've come through the seventh fire and we're lighting the eighth fire. So we would come to a fork in the road or a time human beings where we would have to decide. And I see that often spoken about in the book um, about what are we going to do now? Like we know all of this is happening and what are we going to do? And so the rekindling of the eighth fire calls upon a new type of human being. And that new human being is sort of mature. And they, we say the Ashkemadzig, the new people. And they would come from all four directions, all the, the, the four directions of the world, and decolonize our relationship and reconnect to Mother Earth. And that's talked about in, in the article. And so for me, the, the, there's the Hopi prophecies as well of the two-hearted and the one-hearted, uh, the Code of Handsome Blake, Haudenosaunee prophecies. What's key about the prophecies uh, from, from the elders that I've shared time and you know space with around uh, around the fire is that those prophecies are coming true now. And I think that's really significant because it's very humbling because you do tend to think of those prophecies, oh, that's you know thousands of years in the future. Uh, but so many of them have come true in this lifetime. And so it's quite significant that we're living in that time of prophecy right now. So we are going to transition out of this conversation as much as I think we could stay here for a long time and get a lot of a lot of good juice. Um, we're going to transition into breakout so that you each have an opportunity to um, meet someone else in the group and engage in in this discussion yourself. So our prompt for you, you'll have about 15 minutes um, and go ahead and split that up into about seven minutes each. We'll let you know when it's the halfway point and it's time to switch. You'll be in groups of two. Um, our prompt for you is, what story have you come to know from others that connects your, connects your present to the past? Thanks, Adam, just put that in the chat. So you'll have access to that in your breakout rooms and enjoy. We'll see you back here in a few minutes. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you had some fruitful dialogue together. I know those breakout spaces usually don't feel like enough time, but it's better to leave hungry than over full, I think. So um, now's an opportunity for us to hear some of your voices and to be able to bring them into this space. So if there's anything that you want to share from your breakouts or any reflections or questions from the dialogue with Malini and Andre, um, feel free to, to chime in. You can just go ahead and unmute yourself and speak away. If I may, my, my name is Luke. Um, I don't know if this is uh, untoward or so disruptive in any way, but um, I've, we, uh, Chris and I were talking in our breakout room and we agreed that yes, the, 
the tide seems to be turning, that more people are aware of the need for this paradigm shift in thought and in culture. But then at the same time, in the back of my tinkling head, my working head on this subject, is I just, I, I get depressed because I, I feel with we, let's say, if I can say, we all have this agreed thought, thought and process, we are blowing against the wind. And I just, I, I find it very difficult to be positive about it. But then Chris said, you should be stubbornly optimistic, like the, the UN leader. But anyway, so I just wanted to throw that out there. Maybe I shouldn't have said it, but anyway, sorry. Goodbye, thank you. Thank you, Luke. Uh, no, don't feel shy about throwing out contrary ideas or different, different ways of feeling. Um, this topic of regeneration is complex and we don't want to shy away from it. So thank you. Andre or Melanie, do either of you want to respond to that or? Not, not to put Andre on the spot, but I think you, you wrote beautifully about it in the book, that, that feeling of hopelessness in the face of, you know, what, what we're, what we're dealing with. And you talked about healing. Um, I can certainly talk a little bit about healing self and systems and how so much of this work involves that, but, uh, I don't know, Andre. Did you want to say anything before I share a bit? No, you, you share it. Okay. Yeah. So, um, you know, just in thinking about uh, really large-scale transformative systemic change that's required, uh, especially in the book. You know, when we we start reading about uh, the emissions and. Uh, the, the levels at which we have already passed certain tipping points is so alarming. Uh, the biodiversity loss, the acidific acidification, I think, of, of the oceans, the coral reefs. I mean, there's things that, you know, I, I, I went to a climate change design charrette at one point, of all things. It was, it, was an, it was a philanthropist that was wanting people to do a design charrette around, how can we talk to people about climate change? Because they don't, they don't want to hear it. And I remember someone saying, because the, the skinny polar bears you know, on their little little isolated glacier is not working anymore. It's not touching people's hearts. And I remember, you know, being alarmed by that, um, that idea that that suffering of our relatives does not evoke uh, compassion. I think it's in the face of complexity. So maybe there is compassion, but you know, you feel like, what can I really do about the polar bears and the little frog that that only mates in the, the little pools up in the Amazon. And because of rising temperatures, those little pools don't exist anymore. So there's this little frog that's not here anymore. And it's happening every day, right? At such a large scale. And so the, the, these intractable kind of problems that we are, we are seeing right now can be, can be so overwhelming. And in the face of that, you know, maintaining hope. And I was, I was on a call recently where, where someone asked about hope. And I say, well, I think the, the prophecies have foretold that we would make a choice. And I think we are making a choice, but we're also um, finding that the reconnection to storytelling and, and, and ideas that were mythologized. And I think it's interesting to think about mythology because I had an opportunity uh, a few years ago to join some people in Eastern Europe to, to offer a ceremony because these people were dreaming about a spirit helper a being and this being is related to our thunderbirds uh here and and so they had reached out to some some elders from the blackfoot territory but that elder had to go home and so i was there i was on my way to stockholm uh to speak at uh, resilience 2017 at the stockholm resilience center about the anthropocentric bias of climate science i think is what i was talking about in that talk <clears throat> but anyway on the way there i was invited to climb a mountain I had gone into ceremony before I went. I offered tobacco to an elder back home and asked about this, this being that had been put to sleep, put to sleep by church and state. And this being was a dragon. And I, I don't know a lot about dragons because those are spirit helpers from other places, uh, but they're related to our thunder beings, which is our thunder and lightning uh, sacred beings, Benesse. So I, I asked in ceremony and they said, oh, yes. And that dragon came into our sweat lodge. It was one of the hottest sweat lodges I've, I've ever been in some 
I'm a sweat hog. I've been going since I was young, but it was really, really hot. I remember actually icing myself down. My husband was with me, Sly. I had like ice cubes all over me in between the rounds. And so my auntie, she said, uh, just one nostril of that dragon fit into the door of our sweat lodge when we invited that being in. That's how big that dragon was. So when I asked the people there, I said, do you know where your dragon lived? And they said, yes, we do. And this was in uh, Slovenia. It's, we'll, we'll leave at sun, sunrise and we'll go and we'll do this offering. And I had brought a birch bark scroll because the, the dragon spirit told us what their sign looked like. It was an image. And so this young man in the community stayed up all night and he burned that image into a birch bark scroll. And so I went over there and uh, my, I remember this because my luggage didn't arrive. So I was in pajamas. The only thing I could buy in, in Slovenia at the store was a pair of pajamas. Um, so I was living in pajamas for those three or four days. And, uh, and we went to the top of the mountain and we did a, a ceremony because they said that the church and state, the dragon had gone, been put to sleep by uh, the drawbridge of a moat around a castle. And different people in that community had dreamt of this dragon. And I was just telling this story to a professor who's from, she said she's from Croatia originally, but grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio, and is now teaching in Switzerland. And she said her grandmother in Croatia talked about water sprites, the little beings and, and the, the energy of the forest. And so that disenchantment of the world, I really think that's a huge part of how to regain hope is to know that this isn't only up to human beings. This is up to all of the spirit helpers. We have to ask them for help. We have to talk to them. And they are the ones that are helping guide this. They are the ones. So when you, when whatever your traditions or cultures are in your uh, spirituality, uh, and I know there's talk of, of sort of secular spirituality that's not really tied to a religion. It's really about a relationship with Mother Earth and our ancestors and those spirit beings. I think that's such a huge part of what's be, what, what's, what we need to be grounded in for to be hopeful because it is very daunting um is that they are there to help us and if we can reach out to them and remember how to do that then we will be able to access knowledge that comes from a place of spirit not just intellect so our chronically overdeveloped reason gets us in trouble as my uncle dan said thank you so much Melanie. thank you so much Melanie. that's just very terrific and empowering. And I'll sign off now, but uh, Andrew, just to say, you wrote the most beautiful book. I think it's just a brilliant book on time and water. And a, a friend and an advisor of mine who works in, in waste in the EU Commission said, Luke, reread it. It's even better. So just well done. Thank you so much. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. Melanie, and thanks, Luke. Is there anyone else that has something to share or a question? I may. I, I could ask a question, if that's okay. Um, it, it's Chris Irwin. Um, uh, I was struck, Melanie, by your comments about systems thinking, um, which is also something I'm very interested in, and um, I, I'm uh, enthusiastic um, about Danella Meadows, um, and I've read quite a lot of her stuff, and one of the things that um, really impressed me that she was suggesting that to change paradigms, to change uh, mental models, um, the most powerful way is, um, is uh, well, no, to change behavior, sorry, the most powerful way is to change mental models and paradigms. And so whenever I read that, it's, I think, her number one lever, I've been sort of looking at how to change paradigms, you know, how does one do that? And, um, uh, um, and so I've been looking at different ways. I've been reading Roman Krisnik and his Good Ancestor book and learning about seventh generation thinking. And um, I obviously I came across uh, Andre and, and his work. Um, uh, um, and I think one of the things, I think Andre, you spoke about it on a video recently that I saw um, talking about some of the things that we see, some of the things where people are being um, challenged in their mental models because things aren't going according to plan. You know, so we we see COVID and we see forest fires and we see droughts and hurricanes. And um, so that's challenging people's mental models and they're starting to see cracks, you know, forming. Um, uh, and so there, I think there's opportunities there to try to, you know, lever those cracks open. And, and I'm always looking for ways to do that. And, I, you know, so, so I think that's why I'm very interested in this topic about how we can use storytelling and how we can use language and art to 
to give people different ways of thinking, you know, so that they can make better decisions, you know, in the future. Um, so that's just a kind of comment and observation. There's a, there's a thing that uh, I have, uh, the, the hope issue is also like, because I frequently talk to young people, both as a children's book author and then as coming from the Time in Water author also talking to teenagers and uh, maybe college students and sometimes climate strike groups. And uh, because of course, lots of them uh, are feeling this lack of hope and lack, lack of purpose. And I felt it myself when I was writing the book, I was like, you know, am I just, uh, so the first time I met a group like that, I was just kind of reciting the data, just telling them, you know, this is happening to the glaciers, this is happening to the species. And I, and, and I, I forgot to frame it, like, uh, or because I didn't really know myself how to frame it. And, and I felt like just I was turning off the lights in their eyes. I just saw the, the, just how the whole group just, just how they just turned blank. And, uh, and I was like, and I didn't want to come to them as some kind of a doomsday prophet telling them they were too late to the party. Sorry, guys, you just, it's, it's, and, uh, and for myself to finish the book, I couldn't really finish it until I felt some kind of hope and, and not false hope. Uh, and it had to be grounded either on both some gut feeling and also maybe even on data on, on, on what the science was telling us. Uh, so, uh, so in the end, I started to kind of, again, use this generational talk of, of, you know, they're not unlucky to be born today. You know, you, you were not lucky if you were born in Europe in 1910, and you were not lucky to be born in Europe in 1940, uh, and you were not lucky to be born in any decade before that, because, uh, you know, 1860 or something, you know, every generation has had uh, great challenges and, and even huge catastrophes that they have gone through. So, so we're actually not, even in that stake historically, you know, if we look at human lives and et cetera, uh, the mistakes of the past have, have actually brought us lots of tools that we can use and learn from. Uh, it's, it's, it's both a spiritual, mental, cultural shift that we have to go through, but also a technological shift and I tell them that it doesn't matter. So, and I tell them that this is actually the biggest generation on earth of children that the earth has ever seen. Like uh, we are actually the youngest earth uh, in terms of population, pop population that we've ever seen. And if that generation goes through a, a paradigm shift, then, then the mass of that paradigm shift can be so enormous. So that I tell them, you know, it doesn't matter what you study, if you go into fashion, that has to go through a huge shift, transportation, energy, food, agriculture. Uh, and so both in terms of technology, but also mindset. So, so while scientists tell, tell us that uh, there is space for all of us on the planet, so we don't have to, you know, fight over the resources, we just have to find the wise way of realigning ourselves towards nature. That, that, that the, the good thing is that whatever pro profession they choose, uh, there will be a higher purpose in almost every single job or every single uh, industry that they find themselves because there's so much at stake and there's so much of mistakes that have been made in the past and so much low hanging fruit that uh, while they're picking these low hanging fruits, they will see so many rewards just in uh, the first five, 10, 15 years of, 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 of actively fixing these things. And, and so, so you can frame it as, okay, so we're supposed to fix the mess that you made. You can frame it that way, but also but also, you know, it's not like those that were building the bridges and, and building the hospitals and basically the infrastructure that we have. It's not like that wasn't difficult. Yes, many of that was made in the wrong way, 
but I think most of it was made in good intentions of making life better for their, their offspring. Mm -hmm. So then it, there's a, this transition period of, yes, we've been making stupid highways for 20 years, but also it's agonizing to be a generation that is not feeling that they're making life better for their offspring. So it's not like everybody's working in joy within the system that we're in now, if you understand what I say. So that uh, it's not like we're all just, just, uh, yeah, so so I tell them that whatever you choose, there, there, there will be higher meaning found in almost everything. So like my 15 year old daughters, they had a project and half the class decided to work on how to work on garbage. You know, because when I was 15, I wouldn't have done a project on garbage, but they thought they were so uh, in so high spirits, like, yeah, I want to work on garbage in the future. <laughs> and, 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 and so, so just feeling that kind of spirit in fields that had been neglected when you wanted to go to finance or banking, not garbage. So, so, so if you, if that shift happens in a whole generation, then you can see some kind of that, that first we feel nothing is happening, but then this may ho hopefully exponential kind of phase of, of, of less damage and, and more regeneration. Yes, that's a great perspective. Thank you, Andre. So our time is coming to a close. I'm sorry we didn't have an opportunity to hear from more of you, but thank you, Chris and Luke, for, for sharing your thoughts. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Malini in just a minute for our close, but before I do, I just wanna say that Solvable feels so privileged to be able to hold spaces like this of change, and we really see it as the core of our work. So thank you for sharing this space with us and, and being here with us. It, it's it's our meaningful work and our passion. Um, our next New Works conversation will be in two weeks on the 16th on regenerative economics. Uh, we are co-hosting it with In Rhythm and John Fullerton will be our guest. So I'm sure it will be another lively conversation. We hope that you can join us there. So Mulaney, over to you. Miigwech. Well, it's been uh, such a pleasure and honor to sit in circle with all of you and with you, Andre. And I would I would like to <clears throat> share one of my many favorite passages that I have uh, from the book. Uh, so for those of you, uh, I saw Joan um, say she's looking forward to reading the book. Hi, Joan. Um, it's a beautiful book and there was so much in it that resonated. But this particular page, 176, I'm going to read something and then I'm going to ask my my chum, my friend and colleague, Carrie Ann Agua, uh, to offer a song. And in particular, because in our culture, uh, we have a teaching of balance, and that balance is between uh is this the sun, and Nokomistubiki is this the moon. And so the sun is fire, and that's uh, male energy. So men are fire keepers. My husband's a fire keeper. And the, the moon is uh, related to water, and so women are water keepers. And so there's, there's a teaching there of balance. You know, too much fire will... Um, evaporate the water too much water will put out a fire and so there's there's really this principle of um, balance and so I'm just going to share this and it's about uh, it, it's part of the time um, kind of the thought experiments that happen uh, throughout the book and and this one in particular is very moving so I have my tissue nearby because I tried to read it out loud this morning to myself and I had some tears coming down so maybe I can get through it where the glacier once touched the sky, there will be only sky. Our grandchildren will look up at old maps and try to imagine a mountain made of frozen water. They will try to understand its nature, a thousand meters of ice filling a whole valley. They will draw lines in their minds and strings between peaks, imagining a glacier that is so thick, the world's tallest towers pale in comparison. They will point to the air and say, that's where the campsite was, up there, right under the clouds. That's where the two of them pitched up on their honeymoon. Our grandchildren will try to conjure mental pictures, try to envision a snowmobile traveling across the sky, towing, singing skiers. It is impossible to imagine what else will be happening in the world at that time, and impossible to say what words and concepts will be used about our time. It depends on us, on what we do right now. In the summer of 2019, I was given the strange task 
the strange task of writing a memorial for the Okjokul, am I saying that correctly? Glacier. The first of hundreds of glaciers Iceland will lose over the next 200 years. It took me quite some time. I wondered who I was addressing with the words on the plaque. I wondered at the absurdity of the task. How do you say goodbye, goodbye to a glacier? In the end, I came up with this. OK is the first Icelandic glacier to lose its status as a glacier. In the next 200 years, all our glaciers are expected to follow the same path. This monument acknowledges that we know what is happening and what needs to be done. Only you know if we did it. So Andre talks about glaciers as alive and sentient beings, which resonates with our culture. So I'd like to ask Carrie Ann to sing a song in honor of the glaciers of Nibé, of the water, Miigwech. And you can introduce yourself. Yeah. Okay. Um, my name is a uh, yellow cloud woman. Uh, I also go by Carrie and Egwa. My my clan is the turtle. I come from the land of the birch trees, which is Whitefish River First Nation, located in the Robinson Huron Treaty in uh, northern Ontario, close to Manitoulin Island. And um, I am a Anishinaabe woman and a Windigo Khan, which is a contrary. And a contrary has specific roles in in society and. Uh, one of them is not always uh, favorable, but eh, you know, what can you do? <laughs> so um, I'm going to sing a song that's called uh, Serenity. Um, and um, the, for the calmness, you know, um, so we talked about um, hope, you know, and, and um, usually before we get to hope, there's this this massive amount of fear, right? You know, where, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? And so we try and gravitate towards hope because to to get us out of that that fear, you know, and, and to propel us and move us forward. Um, and we need a sense of calm to be able to do that, to get into, to transition towards that. And when Melanie was speaking about being in the, in the sweat lodge and uh, being it really, really hot, my role as a singer is to, um, is to sing and to sing prayer um so it calms people down and and um so they can continue on with what they need to do continue on with praying for people continue on with with healing themselves you know and so um this is one of the songs that i'll sing usually in the third round because by the time the third round comes where we it open the doorway that's the third you know three times and you know let let the air come in and we uh People are just like, oh yeah, you know, uh, wanting to kiss the ground because it's so hot, and and uh, and then they close it again, and we we move forward again, and uh, this helps them. So you might hear, I'm just going to warn you now, you might hear my dog chasing um, a little kitten in the background because <laughs> they're trying to get to know each other. It's the relationships, right? I could go in and intervene. However, you know, I know that they're both safe with each other. They're just trying to figure each other out. And so I, I'm allowing it to happen, um, which is which is understanding um, the nature of, you know, relationships. And then they're, especially theirs. <clears throat> okay. I am Hey, hey, hi, hi, oh. 
Haya ho he a he he a. Haya ho he a he he a. We a he we a he we a ha yo he we a ha he a. We a he he ha ha yo. Haya ho he a he he a. Haya ho he a he he a. We a he we a he we a ha yo he we a ha he a. We a he he ha ha yo. Haya ho we a he we a. Haya ho we a he we a. We a he we a he we a ha yo he we a ha he a. We a he he ha ha yo. Ah, uh, miigwech, 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 miigwech. Mm. Thank you, Carrie Ann. That was so moving and a perfect way to close our time together. Thanks again, Melanie and Andre, for being here with us and all of the gifts that you shared. And thank you to everyone else for being in this space and, and likewise with all the gifts that you shared. So that concludes our time together and we hope to see you again soon. Be well. Miigwech. Thank you. I'm a P. You're wonderful. Hi, everyone.